I really hated meeting at the country club every few weeks. They seemed to have a million excuses for throwing some frivolous party so a bunch of rich people could get together and enjoy their egos. My wife, Sandra, loved going there and always seemed to look forward to it. Unfortunately, in the last year, she started drinking too much, and sometimes she ended up embarrassing herself or me. Sandra and I were married for 24 years. We have three children. They are all in college. I met my wife while I was getting my MBA, and we had a good relationship right off the bat. About 10 years ago, our relationship began to cool down, and I assumed it was natural. I wouldn't mind a little more affection and sex, but I didn't want to insist. I've almost accepted that the rest of my life won't be as romantic. I had a good job and made good money. It was great, actually. Putting three kids through college took up a lot of our budget and savings. But we were still wealthy. Of course, Sandra didn't need to work and didn't want to. She spent time on community service and social activities. My income was needed to support this. She still looked good for her age. I think a lot of this was the result of numerous trips to the spa and beauty salon. I was rather average, a little extra weight around the belly and a little gray at the temples. I dressed well because of my job and my wife's love of shopping. I was good at my job but not entirely happy. I was ready to try something new, something that I would enjoy and wouldn't have to worry about how much it paid. I also wanted to move to another place. The house was too big for the two of us and I didn't like the expense and time it took to maintain it. My wife didn't even want to discuss such ridiculous ideas. She wanted her big house, a country club, and rich friends. At one of these meetings, I wandered around the club, joining in conversations here and there about stupid things. The night was drawing to a close, and I had been slowly drinking my last drink for an hour or so. Sandra, on the other hand, was just starting to heat up. She seemed to drink a little more than usual, and it showed. Eight or ten local widows were sitting together chatting when I approached. The conversation seemed to be about sex. This was my signal to turn around and leave. As I turned to leave the room, I heard my wife speak louder than usual. Damn, if it weren't for Todd Mitchell, I would never have had good sex in my life. The group suddenly fell silent. Some ladies noticed me standing nearby. As if prompted by the lack of laughter, Sandra turned and saw me. The excess alcohol was definitely affecting her judgment. Robert, I didn't know you were standing here. You weren't supposed to hear that, honey. I'm sorry, it's my fault. She added a few drunken giggles like a little girl. The ladies sitting nearby didn't know how to react. Some of them quietly left, while the rest just sat there without talking. Sandra looked at me with a stupid grin on her face, as if she had just committed something naughty. I placed my glass on a nearby table and slowly left the room and the club. I didn't go home. I went to the airport, and 30 minutes later I was on a commuter flight to Reno. I liked Reno much better than Las Vegas. My relationship with Sandra is much clearer now. I was able to understand things that had eluded me until that moment. The weekend in Reno should have cleared up a few more things. I turned off my mobile phone. It was not difficult for me to find a room in one of the casinos. I opened an account for $20,000, and a toll-free number soon followed. An interesting thing about casino accounts is that since they are not banks, they are not subject to federal regulations and are not required to report to the government. If you win a large amount on a slot or cano, it should be reported, but any funds you deposit into your account are untraceable. I wasn't really interested in the gambling per se, but I did like their banking system. By the time I woke up, it was already midday on Saturday. I analyzed my situation over a hamburger and fries. I loved it in Reno. The climate was comfortable due to the high altitude. Due to gambling, there were many other reasonable services nearby. I needed to take a walk along Truquay to pay tribute to all the broken marriages. I wasn't planning on getting a divorce in Reno, but I might add my wedding ring to the bottom of the river later. On my way back to the hotel casino, I passed a realtor's office with lots of pictures in the window. Suddenly, an apartment in Reno seemed like a smart idea. After an hour in the office and two hours traveling, I found a small furnished apartment that I really liked. The problem was that I couldn't buy it while I was married. Luckily, I was able to arrange a discreet rent-to-own agreement with a large deposit. The large deposit was my idea, 
and the seller approved it. One of the best decisions I made early in our marriage was to manage and control the family finances myself. Sandra had no aptitude for numbers or banking. She was more than happy to let me pay the bills as long as she could spend the money. I treated myself to a wonderful sushi dinner that evening. Before going to bed, I deposited another $10,000 from my Visa card into the casino account. I didn't like paying a fee for withdrawing cash, but in this case, I thought it was worth it. I woke up early the next morning and had breakfast in the casino restaurant. The eggs, bacon, potato hash, and toast hit the spot. I was trying to kill time with my second cup of coffee when I noticed that my waitress had a large bruise. She tried to hide it by combing her hair forward, but it didn't work. She was a pleasant-looking woman of about 45. I watched as she rushed from table to table, trying to please everyone. I got the impression that this was new to her because she was trying too hard. An experienced waitress would have been a little calmer and more confident. She seemed determined to do her job well, and I admired that. Your name tag says Donna. Is that your real name? No, my name is Dora, but Do was the closest badge they had. Well, Dora, I'll take another cup of coffee, and I promise to leave a generous tip if you tell me about the bruise. What if I give you a refill and you leave a smaller tip and forget about your question? Fair enough. It was rude of me to mind my own business. I already had a key to the apartment, so I decided to buy a few things to furnish my home. First stop was the Silver Spur dealership down the street. I chose a Focus sedan that had more miles on it than I cared to admit. It would hardly be suitable for a long trip, but it was quite suitable for trips around the city. I figured I could rent it but planned to return regularly for a while. For a couple of hundred dollars, I was able to buy everything I needed for a comfortable life, including several sets of clothes. I spent the rest of the day opening accounts at several casinos. I wrote checks to the name of the place where I was located. Money came into my account and disappeared. No audit trail. By the end of the day, I had deposited $60,000 at four different casinos. I bought a small spiral notepad that I could carry in my pocket and wrote down amounts, dates, and casino names in it. It was a chronological entry of the money I lost, gambling over the weekend. Of course, uh, I didn't make a single bet, but who will challenge me? Everyone knew I was a terrible poker player, so any losses I had at roulette, craps, or blackjack would have been believable. I had six months to put together a down payment on an apartment. This shouldn't have been a problem. I completely forgot about lunch, so by dinner I was hungry as a wolf. The easiest place to hike was where I had breakfast. As luck would have it, Dora was my waitress. Why are you still here? Looks like a long day. I have to work double shifts to make ends meet. I didn't think the rent would be so high here. What will you drink? It's better not to be too curious. I ordered my lunch and tried to behave for the rest of the time. When I finished, she brought me the bill and paused for a moment. Sorry for my abruptness this morning. I'm trying to get used to life here and I'm a little uneasy about the eye. It was a parting gift from my husband when I told him I was moving here to get a divorce. This isn't the first time, but I hope it's the last one. Thanks for the generous tip for breakfast, by the way. It helped. She smiled as she left, but it was a sad smile. I thought about her for the rest of the evening. That night I came to the conclusion that there was nothing more for me to do. I needed to get home to arrange a few things before I could arrange anything else here. I had no trouble finding a flight back, but I wasn't sure what I would do when I got back. Dora was working the next morning, and I was able to grab one of her tables. I stopped her when she brought the bill after lunch. I have a little problem, and I was wondering if you could help me. I have to leave today and won't be back for a week or so. I need someone to house sit for me. It's a two-bedroom apartment, so you don't have to worry about any housing conflict X. Could you help me? It will be for at least a couple of months. Are you serious? No strings attached? I don't want to leave the place empty. 90% of the time it will be all yours. And when I'm here, I'll stay away. I promise. I didn't really care if someone broke in and took the whole place clean. There wasn't much to lose. I couldn't let Dora understand this. Okay, is it close to the diner? It's pretty close, but I'm leaving my car with you too. 
Make sure it always has gas in it when I get back. I'll call you ahead. There's an answering machine on the phone. Dora just stood there and looked at me. I think she was afraid it was a setup. I didn't have time to convince her otherwise. Here are the keys to the apartment and the car. The car is parked at the apartment. It's a dark blue Ford Focus. Here is the address of the apartment. If you're uncomfortable, don't go. I'll pick up the keys when I get back next Friday. I wrote the address on a napkin and handed it to her. She took a napkin and keys and just looked at me. Dora, don't worry about it. If you decide to do it, that's good. If you decide not to, that's also good. An hour later, I was on my flight home. I'd rather stay in Reno. After I picked up my car at the long-term parking lot, I drove past the house. Sandra's car wasn't there, so I decided to pick up a few things for the rest of the week. I loaded the car with underwear, clothes, shoes, and my laptop. It took less than 10 minutes. I also took my passport and birth certificate. The company had several blocks with a kitchen by agreement. My position allowed me to use one of them at my discretion. I have reserved it for the next two weeks. I put my laptop battery on charge and then called my oldest son, Jason. I told him that his mother and I were having family problems and I would be busy for a while. I asked him to explain this to his sisters and tell them not to worry. All three were at Auburn. I received a group discount but still had to pay non-resident tuition. At least I could afford it. I hung up, put my cell phone on charge, and took a shower. The only thing they gave me on the plane was a bag of peanuts. I was looking forward to a good dinner. Monday was a busy day. Before I did anything else, I went to the bank and took out a second mortgage on the house. A large one. I now owe more on the house than it was worth. By the end of this month, that was going to change. I contacted Auburn directly from the bank and we reached an agreement to prepay the children's tuition. The bank transferred $240,000 directly to the school. That left me with a cashier's check for just over $200,000 to take with me to Reno. I cashed in two CDs, paid the penalty, and closed the money market account. I decided to leave the credit cards alone until the end of the month. By then, I was late for work. My faithful secretary was waiting for me with black coffee and a stupid smile. Good morning, Mr. Terrell. Will you tell me what happened at the country club on Friday? Or will I have to believe all the rumors? Emily, all the rumors are true. What else do you need to know? Without blinking an eye, she answered, What can I do for you to help? Give me all the information you can find about Todd Mitchell. I think he once worked here, but I'm not sure. Arrange for all my scheduled work to be done by other employees and don't let them know the reason. Any meetings or appointments I have scheduled should also be rescheduled. Any other questions? I received a big smile and an okay gesture from Emily as she left the office. I initially thought that it would take me several weeks to settle my affairs, but now I realize that everything could be done in a week. I have made an appointment with a lawyer for the near future. On the way out, I informed Emily that I would not be taking or answering calls from my wife. Security was not allowed to let her into the building. Jerry Proctor has been a friend of mine since college. We liked each other, but Jerry never liked Sandra. I decided that he would be the perfect person to handle my divorce. I was at the country club on Friday, Robert, so I think I know why you're here. You are right. I don't want to sound like a smartass, Bob, but it was time. Right again. I figured I could handle it as long as I wasn't publicly humiliated. That ended on Friday. I need access to all your accounts and a couple of powers of attorney. I'll have my secretary prepare all the paperwork and then call you. Is there anything special I should know about? Well, Jerry... I'm afraid the trauma of what happened on Friday triggered something in me. I found myself becoming addicted to gambling. I spent the weekend in Reno and lost thousands and thousands of dollars. I'm going back there. Next weekend, and I'm afraid it will be even worse. Oh, dear friend, this is terrible. I assume you keep some kind of record or documentation of all these losses. Jerry had a big smile on his face. I have and will. I think it would be nice if I sent you copies of everything. Definitely. You know, Bob, I don't think we should talk about this anymore. Do you agree? You're right. Do you need anything else? 
It's okay, Bob. Get out of here and get busy. Take this financial form with you. Fill it out and bring it when you sign the forms tomorrow. I've got your back, buddy. Around this time, I realized that I had missed lunch. Emily prepared a short note for me with information about Todd Mitchell. She recommended that I speak with Wilma Grimm in HR before taking any action. Wilma worked at the company forever. She ruled strictly but effectively. She always wore a business suit and always wore her hair in a formal bun. Her confidence made her a little intimidating to everyone who met her. If Emily wanted me to see her, it had to be important. Good afternoon, Mr. Terrell. Please have a seat. She tried to calm me down, but it didn't work. I felt like I was in a room with a nun teacher. I was an adult in an important position, and I was in awe of this woman. She closed the door to her office. Emily told me what was going on. I don't spread office gossip, but I deal with facts. Todd Mitchell came to me in confidence three years ago. I swore. I promised that I wouldn't tell anyone about what was discussed at that time, but I can't seem to keep that promise. If at any time you feel offended by anything I say, please stand up and leave, and our conversation will be over. If you don't like what you hear, don't be mad at me. I'll just give you the facts. Do you understand, Mr. Terrell? Yes, I understand. I think I'm old enough to accept whatever you tell me without throwing a fit. She frowned a little at my attempt at a joke. About three and a half years ago, your wife, Sandra, approached Todd Mitchell at a company event. There was a lot of drinking that evening, and by the end of the evening, Todd and Sandra were having sex in one of the private offices. Todd was getting married the next month. Sandra threatened to tell his fiance if he did not continue to meet her for sex. He hoped that after the wedding she would leave him alone, but this did not happen. She forced him to have sex with her for several months, threatening to expose her. Desperate, he came to me for help. Of course, he had to tell me the whole story. Naturally, I couldn't in good conscience tell you or anyone else. The best solution I had was to move Todd to another office. After he moved to Dallas, Sandra left him alone. Todd never told his wife about this problem. Any questions? It appears that Mr. Mitchell has become as much a victim in this farce as I have. I was thinking of some form of retribution, but now it seems a little foolish. Do you have any recommendations, Miss Grimm? Now that you know you have the power, I think you should just forget it. Todd Mitchell is a good employee and a valuable asset to the company. Don't ruin him because of what your wife did. Thank you for your time. I think you're right. Being forced to have sex with my wife is punishment enough. When we stood up, Wilma smiled. By the way, this is not a mistake. I've been married for 32 years. It was hard to imagine Wilma Grimm naked in bed with a man. However, perhaps when she lets her hair down, she turns into some kind of sex goddess. I decided to mentally change the subject. I had a lot of other things to worry about besides Wilma's love life. Emily reassigned all my work, and I had a clean slate. My wife called three times and refused to believe I was in Baltimore like Emily said. Emily set up a meeting for me with the company president the next day and one with the legal department for that afternoon. I asked Emily to have dinner with me. She laughed and said that her husband would be against it. She suggested that I invite Vilma and laughed again. The visit to the legal department took longer than I expected and I detained several people after business hours. I apologized, but everyone seemed understanding. It turned out that it was more difficult than I thought. Cashing out my retirement plan was difficult. Closing the 401k and joint savings account went smoothly, but took time. Cashing in my sick time, vacation time, and company insurance was easier than most other things. By then, it became obvious that I'm leaving the company. I hoped it wouldn't get to my wife before I was done. I was left alone for dinner. For some reason, I thought about Dora while eating. I wonder if she moved into an apartment. Is she still working double shifts? Even though I had only met her a few days ago, I was eager to get back to Reno and see her. It seemed a little childish, and I tried to put it out of my mind. It was stupid to waste time thinking about fantasies that would never come true. The next morning, I cashed in two whole-life policies and canceled two term policies. I was amazed at the cash value that whole-life policies have grown to. Checks could be collected the next morning. My car was insured by the company, but I canceled the insurance on Sandra's Lexus. Liz was in her name, but the insurance was in mine. 
Before going to work, I stopped by Jerry's office, left a financial form, and signed a bunch of documents that his secretary had prepared. Emily was already waiting for me with coffee when I returned to the office. It's not my place to add fuel to the fire, boss, but you need to talk to Calvin Bostick in the settlement department before you see Richard. Richard Ryder was the company's president. I was pretty sure he already knew what I wanted to talk to him about. The settlement department was actually in the basement, to be precise. I don't know why everyone else got windows and sunlight and they got a dungeon. Calvin, Emily said you wanted to talk to me. Calvin Bostick was a quiet guy who always got his job done. He was a no-frills man, boring but efficient. He led me to a secluded corner. I've heard things aren't going in your favor in the office. I'm not one for gossip or rumors, but I thought you should know a few things. About six years ago, we had a guy in our office named Raymond Upright. He was normal. Guy, married, he had two children. He started a relationship with your wife after one of the office parties. She kept calling him at home and here in the office. He knew that he had made a mistake and wanted to stop it, but she did not let him. She threatened to tell his wife if he tried to leave her. The fool took her threat at face value. Two days after that, Ray's wife kicked him out. He started drinking and eventually lost his job. Now I don't know where he is. Somehow, no matter what, Ray's wife threatened to tell you about your wife's affair. My understanding is that your wife paid her $10,000 to keep her quiet. I have no proof of that last part. Thanks, Calv. I wonder if anyone else has any good news for me. I didn't mean to upset you, Mr. Terrell, but Emily said I should tell you. You did the right thing. I appreciate it. I went directly to the ninth floor. I was a little early for my meeting with Mr. Ryder, but he received me right away. The conversation was short and to the point. Legal, HR, and payroll will take care of everything for me. When the smoke clears, I have to call him personally, wherever I am. He gave me a card with his personal cell phone number on the back. There were no promises, no regrets, no empty talk. Although the cases were settled on the one hand, on the other they remained open. I nodded to him in greeting and left. I didn't say a word. Emily was smiling when I returned to the office. She handed me a regular cup of coffee. I smiled back and said, Book me a flight to Reno on Thursday morning with a two-hour layover in Dallas. She motioned with her head for me to look out the window. Sandra was arguing with the security guard in the parking lot. She's been in there for over 20 minutes. They won't let her in and she won't leave. What do you want to do, boss? The guards seem to have everything under control. The only problem I have is finding someone for dinner. I don't like eating alone. I called Jerry to see how things were going. He said he couldn't do anything until I sorted out the financial mess. I needed to show him that I had no money. Now I have a lot of them. Between the checks I had, the ones that were due, and the cash in the bank, I was a rich man. I promised to go to Reno early and not return until I was penniless. Sometimes someone would look in the door and tell me that my wife wanted me to call her. She forced all her friends to call their husbands at work to find me. I spent a few more hours in the office, organizing things to make things easier for my successor. Sandra was sitting on the hood of my car waiting for me to get out. Emily smiled and handed me the keys to her Honda Civic. She said it was a good excuse for her husband to pick her up and take her out to dinner. By the way, you're not planning on doing anything stupid in Dallas, are you? No, just tying up a few loose ends. No retaliation, I promise. I drove to Allentown and had dinner at Outback. I returned to my apartment before midnight. The next morning, everything went quickly. I signed more paperwork for Jerry, closed all the bank accounts, and canceled all the credit cards. I even arranged for all utilities in the house to be shut off for the next week. I collected checks from the bank, insurance company, and work. I didn't even realize how much money I had. I bought a new cell phone and canceled the ones Sandra and I were using. I sold my country club membership to an old friend for $23,000. My successor was already there when I walked into work for the last time. He seemed like a nice guy. He came from Boston with 24 hours notice. He knew this was a good step for him. Emily knew more about office work than I did, so I didn't need to train him. There were things in the house that I wanted to take. 
but they weren't important enough for me to come back for them. Emily told me to leave her car, and her husband would pick her up at the airport. I needed to buy a couple of cheap suitcases to store my belongings from the apartment. Anything I forgot, I could buy in Reno. Suddenly, I realized that I had done everything I could. All my assets were now cash. There were no stocks, no bills, and nothing else of value except the house, which I left to my wife. Air Blue was very helpful. They had seats available and were more than willing to reschedule my flight. I called Jerry at home. Hey, buddy, just wanted to let you know I'm leaving tonight. I'm guessing you have everything you need. Yes, Bob, I'm fine. I could start the paperwork tomorrow, but I still need the financial information ASAP. You can start processing. I'll start sending you proof of financial insolvency as soon as I can. Be careful, Bob. I don't want both of us to get into trouble. I'm sure Sandra will find herself a good lawyer, probably from Philadelphia. Of course, he will work for a percentage and may abandon her as soon as the case goes wrong. So, it's all up to you now, Jerry. Do your best for me. Just don't inflate the bill too much. I'm about to become a very poor man. Don't forget that. One more thing. Try to find Raymond Upright. He might need some help. Depending on the circumstances, I may be able to help him. Got it, Bobby. Have a safe flight and stay in touch. I called the apartment and left a message on the answering machine that I would arrive later that evening. I told her I would call and didn't want her to be scared by hearing someone at the door. At that moment, I didn't know whether she would be there or not. I could hope. It was strange that I didn't even know this woman, but I was hoping for some kind of relationship with her. At that point, even friendship would have been nice. Her situation made her vulnerable, and I didn't want to seem like I was taking advantage of that. I arrived in Dallas early enough to have a quiet lunch. I was waiting in Todd Mitchell's office when he arrived. I could tell he wasn't happy to see me. Mr. Terrell, I'd like to say I'm glad to see you, but that wouldn't be true. I think we both know why. Relax, Todd. I hope you don't feel uncomfortable if I'm a little familiar. I didn't come to give you any trouble. I just wanted to let you know that I understand the situation you found yourself in a while ago and that I have no complaints against you. You could do it over the phone. I know, but it was along the way, and I thought it was worth my time to clear things up. I don't understand. Why do you want to do this? I'm the one who should apologize to you for what happened. You didn't do anything wrong. I was young and stupid and made a terrible mistake. I'm still ashamed to even talk about it. This to my wife. You were partly to blame for what happened, Todd, but I feel like most of the problems were caused by my wife. What she did created problems for you and now for me. I'm not saying you were totally innocent, but it's not entirely your fault. I don't want you to bear any more guilt than necessary because my loving wife was careless. It's very noble of you to say that. I don't know what to say or what to do. In response, I handed him Jerry's business card. Give my lawyer a call later today. He may ask you to do something for me. It will be very discreet. He may say he doesn't need anything at this time. At the very least, I expect him to ask for a certified statement. Confirming the scam, I promise that this will not reach your wife. I stood up and we shook hands. It was strange, considering that this person was one of the people who deceived me, but I thought it was appropriate. Todd Mitchell was a good person and did not deserve to have his life ruined because of one mistake, even if it was repeated several times. An hour later, I was back on the flight to Reno, I was trying to figure out what I did wrong. I worked hard to provide my wife and children with everything they could want or need. I think I did pretty well. It seems that while I was making sure everyone was provided for, I was neglecting my wife. When faced with problems like this, we all try to understand why it happened. In my case, I usually come to the conclusion that I am, to some extent, to blame. I can accept this, but when the circle comes full circle, I am forced to face Sandra's attempts to cuckold me. This cannot be accepted or approved. If she had been careful, I might have let it all slide and blame myself forever. But she wasn't careful, and I won't blame myself. The evening ended on a high note. When I landed at Reno Tahoe Airport, I was pleasantly surprised to see Dora waiting at baggage claim. She was wearing jeans and a light blue Oxford shirt. This was the first time I had seen her, in anything other than her uniform. 
I didn't plan for her to meet me when I called. I just wanted her to know I was arriving. Good evening, Dora. I didn't expect to see you. I figured since I took your car, it's the least I can do. You're not working today? No, I was able to reduce my work hours thanks to your generous offer. Oh, I wasn't being generous. I was just trying to figure out a way for me to be alone with you. And what are you going to do with me when you're alone with me? I haven't thought this through yet. Any suggestions? As I pulled my bags from the belt, I noticed Dora blush a little. I decided it was time to back off before I scared her off. I felt like she was egging me on a little when she asked the question, which was a good sign. Thirty minutes later, we returned to the newly renovated apartment. These were small touches that didn't cost much but made a difference to the ambience of the whole place. To thank her for decorating the apartment and picking me up at the airport, I arranged a dinner for two with a prime rib main course. I think Dora enjoyed the wine more than the meat. How's your divorce going? No good. I still have three weeks before I can apply. You need six weeks to establish residency. Apparently, I thought it would be easier. I think I'd be better off doing it from the house. Why didn't you do it? Dora was silent for a while. She played with her food and then looked up. Leaving Tony was more important than a divorce. A divorce is just a piece of paper. It won't protect me from further beatings. I think I used the idea of a divorce to justify coming here. It didn't matter where I went. The main thing was that I completely left. What Dora said made sense to me. I think at first the divorce from Sandra seemed important, but now I'm not so sure. All I really wanted was to stop her from taking advantage of our marriage. If I didn't plan to get married again, it didn't matter. I had no such intentions. We spent the rest of the evening chatting about more prosaic things like hobbies, movies, and books. Dora had no children. I didn't ask why. We slept in separate bedrooms that night. Dora left for work before I even woke up. The only thing I needed was fresh coffee. I was still full from yesterday's feast. After a quick shower, I got to work. Jerry, how's my favorite lawyer? A sigh was heard from the other end. Not very good, Robert. I have bad news for you. Do you promise not to shoot the messenger? Oh, damn. I was only out of town for one day. What the hell happened? Sandra made a big deal. She found out about bank accounts and stuff. After calling the police, she got a restraining order on everything. All your accounts are frozen, even if they're empty. You're not allowed anywhere near her or the house. You can't take anything or from home. You're not allowed to have contact with your children, even though they are adults. Most of this is nonsense, but if you want to fix it all, it will take a lot of time and money. She contacted the Securities and Exchange Commission about your 401k and retirement accounts. Somehow she got the IRS interested. Jerry, I don't know how to tell you this, but I don't want anything to do with this. I'm out of the game. Do you understand? I was a little taken aback. I assume you mean you won't handle my divorce case? Exactly, buddy. FYI, she also hired a private investigator to track you down. I wonder how she's going to pay for all this. I don't know, and I don't want to know. Remember, if the cops or feds ask me where you are, I'll have to tell them. I'm not going to risk my career for you, even if I'm your friend. I understand, Jerry. Protect your ass. I'm going to adjust my plans a little. I won't call you for a while. Thanks for your understanding, buddy. I was hoping you'd respond like that. See you around. Well, things didn't go as planned. The best laid plans can collapse overnight. I had several options at this point. One was to take a bus to Carson City and pick up your money. I decided against it because I was too hot. Yes, hot is a good word. I was just trying to get away from my cheating wife. What the hell happened? Since I decided to let the money cool down for a while, I needed to find a place where I could hide. I still had over 4,000 in my pocket. This should have been enough for a while. Why did my wife want to kill me? I'm guessing she didn't realize there was no life insurance anymore. I thought she was smarter. I made a big mistake. I took the bus to San Francisco. $4,000 doesn't go far in the city by the bay. The first thousand went towards getting a social security number and an ID so I could at least get a job. 
I found a room with a bathroom down the hall and a job as a waiter in a nondescript restaurant. About a month later, earned enough to support himself and became a pretty good waiter. Some clients even started asking for my tables. I haven't paid for my cell phone in a while, and the service has been discontinued. I haven't used it since I left Reno. It only cost me a few dollars to get the new prepaid service and about 50 minutes of airtime. I wanted to call Dora, but I didn't know where she was or how to contact her. I decided to call Jerry. Hey, buddy. It's Robert. Just wanted an update from you. Bobby, Bobby. Good to hear from you. Still confused, but not as confused as you think. Where are you now? It's none of your business where I am. The last time I spoke to you, I was overwhelmed with trouble on all sides. Am I still a wanted man? Well, most of that nonsense has gone away, especially since Sandra was arrested. My understanding is that the IRS is still looking for some kind of payment on the 401k accounts. Plus, most of the problems are gone. What do you mean Sandra is under arrest? I thought you of all people would know about this. Have you heard of a guy named Lester Laszlo? Yeah, I met him once, briefly, about three months ago. He tried to kill me when we were interrupted by a few other guys who were also looking for me. While they were arguing about which one of them would get me, I slipped out the back door. How is he connected? Sandra hired Laszlo to kill you. Laszlo was seriously wounded in Reno and revealed himself to the police. He claimed that Sandra was going to cheat him out of $10,000 for a contract, so he turned her in. Believe it or not, the police believed him and charged her charges. She can't pay bail, so she's waiting in jail for her court date. Jerry, I would love to help her if it weren't for the fact that she tried to kill me. I think her parents could help her with bail, but I definitely won't. Let's see what I can do, Bobby. No one is particularly interested in you right now. Do you want me to start the divorce process again? This time we have a good reason. Maybe. A divorce would be nice, but I don't care about it anymore. I think it would make things cleaner. I saved all the previous documents. I think I can still use most of them. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. Your children came home when Sandra got into trouble. They were worried at first, but quickly lost interest when they learned the facts. They want you to call them and let them know you're okay. I'll contact them as soon as I can. How did your money laundering scheme go? Absolutely not. I lost control and lost contact. I'll try to check that next week. Jerry, sometimes even the best laid plans in the world just don't work out. Okay, stay in touch, buddy. One more thing, Jerry. Did Sandra ever say why she wanted to kill me? Not that I know. I assumed it was because of the insurance she didn't know about that you canceled. I contacted the kids and everything was fine. They felt better knowing that the tuition was prepaid. They wanted to know what happened between Sandra and me, but I couldn't bring myself to tell them. Some things will have to be postponed until later. I borrowed a car and drove to Carson City. The safe box was empty. At least she could have left a note. I couldn't complain about it because I gave her the key and access to the box. Did she go to Guadalajara or did she find a place where I couldn't find her? The only way to find out is to check it yourself. There were several small travel agencies in my area of San Francisco. Most of them specialized in group tours for compatible people, which I clearly wasn't one of. I finally found a last-minute cancellation tour to my favorite Mexican city that I could sign up for. This was the first time in my life that I had to raise money for something. The trip wasn't that expensive, I just didn't have a lot of money. I was lucky because several of the guys from the trip worked with me at the restaurant. Most of them signed up for additional excursions, but I had other plans. The first two days were a big disappointment. The Libertad market was bigger than I could have imagined. I realized that this was a bad choice on my part. I hated to think that maybe Dora had decided to take my money and go somewhere more exotic. Perhaps she was in Bangkok or Tahiti. Lord knows how much money was in that safe box to live wherever she wanted. I didn't know whether I should sit and wait for her to pass by or go and look for her. I ended up doing both. By the third day, it became boring. Finally, Robert, where have you been all this time? I turned around and saw Dora standing with her hands on her hips. She was wearing a wide-brimmed straw hat with a red ribbon. Say something, damn it. 
I was going crazy not knowing if you were alive or not. I said nothing. I walked over and kissed her for the first time. I don't know why I didn't do this sooner, but I was glad I did it now. That's a pretty weak explanation. Maybe you could try again? The second kiss was followed by a big hug as I picked her up off the ground. Dora, I missed you so much. You still have to tell me where you've been for the last month, but I can wait until dinner. Let's go home and have dinner. We walked through the market holding hands. I felt happy and content for the first time in a long time. Robert, don't be mad at me, but I spent some of your money. I put most of it in the bank, but I needed a place to live, so I bought us a house. I hoped it wouldn't be a burden for you because you have a lot of money in that bank. It was beautiful. This estate is in a beautiful city, and I was with a wonderful woman. I like it when plans come together. Sandra's parents were able to post bail for her and pay for lawyers. Jerry had no trouble getting her signature on the divorce papers. She ended up getting five to eight years for trying to kill me. It never became clear why. Todd Mitchell gave Jerry his testimony, but Jerry never had to use it. Jerry was able to find Ray upright. He was sober but not in the best position. When Jerry asked him how he could help, Ray said he would like to have a hot dog cart. I felt better after spending $2,400. I settled with the IRS for $4,000. Laszlo is in prison in Nevada with Dora's husband and his brothers. We don't know how long they will be there. We don't want to know. Now I was free to return home. My old job, now with a promotion, was waiting for me. The law was no longer looking for me. As soon as Dora's Mexican divorce is finalized, we plan to get married. The children will come to the wedding during spring break. The house in Guadalajara is lovely, but we're sure we won't be staying there permanently. Dora wants to keep it as a vacation home. Emily is looking forward to my return to work, especially my new position. This is a promotion for her, too. Dora is ready to go with me anywhere, as long as we are together. She wants me to take her to meet Sandra. It will be interesting. My plans didn't work out the way I expected, but who am I to complain? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.